I'm Adam Alexander. The motorsports world lost an icon today. Longtime writer and broadcaster Chris Economaki has died. Best known as the publisher of National Speed Sport News, he was one of the most influential voices in racing. In tribute, Speed Now presents a wind tunnel special report from 2006. Economaki, eyewitness to American racing history. It was only 10 when the roar of racing engines lured him to the track. He needed a way in. This newspaper was his pit pass. 1934, 72 years ago, the Depression shaped the sport. The newsboy took it all in. He met the stars, wrote their stories, took their pictures, worked on their cars. He thumbed his way to far-flung speedways, learning new skills, new ways to communicate his passion for racing. As he made friends and influenced people, his face became familiar far beyond his beloved paper. Racing was going places, and Chris Economaki was there every step of the way. Eyewitness to American racing history. Tonight, he'll tell his story. This special edition of Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by CarQuest. Hi, I'm Dave Despain. Welcome to a special edition of Wind Tunnel presented by CarQuest. Now, there aren't many people in this racing world to whom we would dedicate an entire hour. Chris Economaki is one of those few. Think about it. For anybody to have worked a job for 72 years is pretty amazing. When that job is covering racing, covering it in print in the pages of National Speed Sport News, calling the action for the grandstand crowds as one of the most colorful track announcers ever, or analyzing it on the tube since the earliest days of televised racing. Well, suffice to say that anybody who's done all that is pretty special in our opinion, but I don't expect you to take my word for that. Chris Economaki wrote the book on what we do. He could take the average fairgrounds in America and turn it into a place of magic for two or three hours. There are still some reporters who will ask the tough questions, but, but Chris had a way of doing it. Uh, that he did it with style. It became sort of his trademark. Chris is a really interesting character. He is a genuine certified personality. Uh, in, in a world where so many people seem to be made of jello, he's made of really interesting material. He says interesting things. He has lived an extraordinary life. Even a guy who's won you know, 50 Next Up Cup races sort of looks at Chris and says, man, that guy's done a lot. It's fascinating to me that I'll bring up a topic to Chris and he'll tell me all about it because he was there. There's probably no human being in the United States that has a passion for motorsports like Chris does. He's a true, true icon in the sport of motor racing. Not to be ever, ever uh, be emulated. High praise for a man I've wanted to interview for a long time. Tonight I get the chance. I'm fired up. How about Chris? Have you had time to get ready? Are you prepared? I am always prepared. I, <clears throat> I don't waste any time getting ready. I stay ready. <laughs> when we return, a delightful trip through seven decades of racing history and surely at least one Economaki impression. Yeah, yeah, Tony. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by the 3400 CarQuest Auto Parts stores across North America. CarQuest, the professional choice. And brought to you in part by Edelbrock. Proven performance. Get it at edelbrock.com. Chris Economaki, a 10-year-old New Jersey kid, heard the engines at Hohoka Speedway and ran down to check it out. They wouldn't let him in. Three years later, at age 13, he made his first money from the sport, and he's been covering it ever since. How did you get interested in racing? What what lit you up about racing? You, you were just well, a, a little kid. Well, of course, the, the basic uh, precepts of racing, danger and speed and so forth. And those are the things that attracted everybody in the early days, and to this day, a number of people as well. And, of course, both of those factors are being uh, minimized. You know, NASCAR keeps talking about safer barriers and safer walls, and I say to myself, well, that's fine, but they should shut up about it because it takes away the allure of the sport. 
danger is part of what people buy a ticket to see or to experience. No question about it. Yeah. Here are drivers facing death at every turn at the fair races this Saturday. Come buy a ticket. Sure, that's, that, was, uh, that uh, sells tickets. It's part of the sport. It's the, inherent to the sport. The politically correct would say, oh, that's the old days. We've all grown past that now. We don't think that way. Don't, we don't go to see people get hurt. Well, I don't know how many people are politically correct these days. People don't come to the races to see people get hurt. They come to the races to be excited and to see people escape injury in spectacular crashes. That's my feeling. No change from the way it was when you started, when you were a little Well, kid. the change, of course, is, is the product, you know, faster, faster, speed, more speed. The loudest applause I ever heard was in Indianapolis during practice when Tom Carnegie would say, and it's a new track record. <laughs> And the roof would come off the grandstand. Couldn't tell how fast the car was going. Nobody knows. But they were present when a speed record was set. Talk about it at dinner and so forth. Because we'll never hear that again. We will never, ever, in an auto race, hear that's a new track record. The worst thing that's happened to American auto racing, worldwide auto racing, has been this influx of high technology. Because what that did, in addition to making the cars too fast, has made them too expensive for the sport to sustain. And out of the reach of the average guy with a toolbox. You well, have to be an engineer. True. You know, the, the American racing car historically was homemade. The car owner's investment in his car was time and effort and a few bucks for some parts. Johnny Gerber came east with two cars in the, in the uh, mid thirty, early 30s. He had made a cylinder head himself for the Chevrolet. He's a farmer from Iowa, and he didn't like it, so he, he, he was a single overhead cam head. He made a double overhead cam himself in his barn in Iowa, and it blew everybody off. It had huge valves, I remember. It was, to me, it was intriguing. And then technology arrives. And this part that he used to make, he can't make it, he has to buy. And from whom does he buy it? Some aerospace company that's used to dealing with the government. Carbon fiber, Kevlar, space age materials, and the cost is exorbitant. It's an incredible transition in this sport we're in. Economaki's opinions are grounded in history and experience, and that has a lot to do with a happy geographic coincidence. For that story, we visit the Patterson Museum in New Jersey. Chris, if I say Gasoline Alley to most people, they're going to think Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That's but right. If I say Gasoline Alley to you, you say, oh, no, Patterson, New Jersey. Well, right, Tell me about this. Here's part of it. There's garages you see there, the western end of the original Gasoline Alley. In the east, and this is Ted Horn and his Offenhauser engine car. Horn was a big name in American racing before the war, won a lot of races, and get Patterson a lot of publicity for being headquartered here. And he was killed in 1948, and he's, though a Californian, he's buried uh, close by here in Patterson, his adopted hometown. How did Patterson come to have a gasoline alley? Let's see. Well, uh, when the fair season, the agriculture fair season started, when there was a lot of races, drivers would come with their cars from all over the country and needed a place to headquarter. Oh, okay. And Patterson was centrally located and racing oriented. Add one more happy coincidence, Chris's immediate neighborhood was also home to the newspaper, now synonymous with his name. It's interesting to me that your life and the life of National Speed Sport News are it's essentially... It's the first time you've mentioned it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and I'm surprised you let me go this long without it. They're essentially one, or at least parallel. Yeah. You sold the first copy of the paper, is that accurate? The first standalone issue in August of 1934, I sold, yes, as a newsboy. Standalone issue, meaning that there had been some form of that paper the first, uh The first indication of the newspaper was it appeared as a back page feature 
on a small town weekly newspaper in East Patterson, New Jersey, called the Bergen Herald, and had this auto racing page. Why? Because of all the cars that were garaged there during the fair season in the neighborhood, and people, these visitors from the Midwest and the South, and uh, who were, belonged to the race crews, were living in furnished rooms in in East Patterson, and one of the me local mechanics said to the paper, why don't you publish racing news? All these people are here uh, renting rooms from your homes, and uh, they might like to see what's going on. And that was the beginning of the, the racing section, as it was called. And then as it blossomed and grew and encroached upon the uh, the school board news and what the mayor was doing in East Patterson, <laughs> uh, the, the residents complained, so they separated the racing section out into a tabloid, the form that it enjoys today. Called National Speed Sport News. Exactly. You're welcome. Loud and clear. And it was uh, printed in Ridgewood, New Jersey, where I grew up. And I happened to walk by the Ridgewood News, which had a very large picture window. You could see the press there. And on the press, about to be printed, was the first uh, tabloid issue of National Speed Sport News, which was August 16, 1934. And I went in and got 200 copies, which I sold at the races that weekend for five cents a piece and made a penny. And I had made two dollars in August of 1934, which was a, the, the Depression was still very much in effect. And it was a significant sum of money, particularly for a 13-year-old. Well, over time, that entrepreneurial kid had the opportunity to invest in his beloved paper. Today, he and his family own it. And so for more than three generations, National Speed Sport News has delivered to the fans and to the movers and shakers of the sport, Economaki's perspective, his passion, his opinions, and his weekly column. As a young driver, I, I always felt that uh, unless Chris Economaki noticed you, uh, you weren't going to go anywhere. The editor's notebook, I mean, it's just required reading for uh, if you're involved in motorsport. And it was just phenomenal the amount of information that he would have about all forms of sport and the industry. And uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, people would clamor to get their names mentioned in there. But the thing that, that Chris Economaki, even to this day with his column in National Speed Sport News, has an incredible ability to do is to get inside the sport. And whether you're an insider or just a casual observer, give you a tidbit for you to munch on and, and enjoy. Chris's columns aren't about motors and parts and sway bars and track bars. It's about people. It's about the people who make the sport. Chris is a storyteller. Chris is a legend maker. I still read his column weekly and uh, religiously because I always learn something. And it's, uh, we don't have to do any research. He does it. And, um, and again, I just, uh, he, he has to keep working forever. Otherwise, we just can't deal with it. When we come back, Economaki's view of the nationwide explosion in the 1930s of midget racing. Unequivocally the most important development in American motorsport, without question. Nobody can challenge that. People oftentimes break history down by decade. I suspect that's not a great way to break down the history of American auto racing. It seems to me that perhaps there are eras. Yes, no? The Board Speedway era, I think, was uh, an incredible era in American automobile racing. There were two guys, Art Pillsbury and Jack Prince, who designed and built the tracks. Not only did they build racetracks, they had this survey the country for sections where they could get businessmen who would agree to pay for the track. That's why the board speedways are located in such disparate places, because they found somebody there that was willing to pay to build a track. The first board speedway, and this is very interesting, is built in 1910 in Playa del Rey, California. The guys with the car say, you know, folding the windshield back and taking off the spare tires, not the way to do, we need a special car for this place. So the first racing car was built thanks to the Board Speedway, the very first Board Speedway. So the Board Speedways were really significant in the advancement of auto racing in this country. Significant but short-lived, board tracks quickly gave way to a new phenomenon, midget racing. And 
that gets Chris excited. I think I'm right that you've been quoted as saying that the midget was the most important. You tell me, what is the midget's place in auto racing history? Unequivocally the most important development in American motorsport, without question. Nobody could challenge that. Why? Well, because the auto People race... People today think of midgets as these sort of odd little cars that run oh, here and there. Oh, that's right. They're no longer the big thing they once were. But in the stepladder to uh, a popularity of auto racing in the United States, the midgets are the number one thing. An auto race track was uh, always a half a mile or larger. Many of them took a lot of ground, a lot of property, and they were out someplace. And the auto race uh, required... Uh, travel to get to, and in many cases the man of the house had to get permission from the wife to go or take the family. It was a, quite an undertaking and expensive. When the midget arrived, uh, overnight, every quarter mile track, every high school stadium, every athletic field, sports grounds had the capability of becoming a midget racetrack, and hundreds of them did. Now the man of the house could go to work, come home, have dinner, go downtown to see the midgets, and come home at a reasonable hour. So what happened? The midgets brought racing to the people for the very first time. The people didn't have to go to the races. And that was a monumental step forward for the motorsport. When we return, Hinchliffe Stadium and a walk into history. For the first time in 55 years, Chris visits the former hotbed of New Jersey midget racing. It was there that Economaki first met stock car visionary Bill France Sr. and got a job that changed his life. In the New Jersey Register of Historic Places, Hinchliffe Stadium in Patterson is listed as home to the New York Black Yankees of baseball's Negro National League, a high school sports stadium, a boxing arena, and a midget auto racetrack. When was Brian. the last time you walked through this gate? Uh, 1951, I think, yeah. 55 there. years ago. Thereabouts, yeah. And you haven't been back since? No, I mean, in fact, <laughs> The wall, oh no, there it is. I thought it was gone. It's still there. <laughs> this was the racetrack. Right. This was turn one of the racetrack here. It was a lot smoother then, ah. Huh? What a distressing look. This has got to be the graffiti capital of the eastern United States. Incredible. Seats 10,000 people, and night after night was packed for midget racing. Tuesday and Friday nights, and great racing. Oh, what a distressing look this is now. Sad, really sad. And in 1950, I knelt down in this infield with Bill <laughs> France. I had started to become known as an announcer, and Bill France wanted me to come to Daytona, and we knelt down well, on the grass. Let's clarify why you, you weren't kneeling at the feet of well, Bill France. Well, because we didn't want to have the p obstructive view of the people. <laughs> That's if right. you stand up, people can't see through you. So we squatted down to give the people in the grandstands a chance to see the whole racetrack. You and Bill France meeting for the first time. Right. For what purpose? He was going to hire me to come to Daytona and be the track announcer at the beach on the beach road course. What did you know about Bill France at that point? Well, he was... He'd gotten some publicity in the racing community because uh, of his formation of NASCAR. Okay. NASCAR was two years old at the time, two and a half years old at the time, and uh, he was trying to build it, and he wanted somebody that knew how to sell the sport to the people in the grandstands. So how much was Bill France going to pay you to come down and do... Oh, well, that was a big part of the deal. He guaranteed <laughs> me three days, successive days of announcing at $50 a day. That's $150 for the weekend, and all I had to do was drive 1,300 miles <laughs> each way, pay the gas, pay my meals, and pay my motel room. And you know what? It covered all the costs. I came home with a few bucks. Well, those were the great days, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't done for the money. I, I had never been to Florida before. I wanted to see the world. How old were you then? In 1950, I was 30. 30 years old. And I traveled a lot, uh, and I knew the racing business pretty well. 
The one thing I'm going to have to study up on is the graffiti business. I can't get over this place. <laughs> it's incredible. So you came here as a spectator. Exactly, and as a reporter for the newspaper, National Speed Sport News. These were important races. These races here attracted drivers from all over the country. Californians came here to race. The great driver from Chicago came here to race. And it was great for publicity. The guy said, well, for Friday night's races, so-and-so, the champion from Kansas City, is going to join the field. And that kind of stuff. And it helped fill up the grandstand. The stats support Chris's view of midget racing's importance. At the peak, there were a thousand midget tracks nationwide, and the biggest events, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Chicago, drew more than 50,000 fans. It was a phenomenal period in American racing, but it didn't last long. There was this incredible midget era, as you described it, perhaps the most important development in American auto racing, I think you've called it. What happened? Where did it go? Every car was homemade, and some guy that had a toolbox would go and look at it and admire some of the craftsmanship. See, this guy made this thing. It's beautiful. And then in the late 40s, Curtis Craft, a company in California, started making production model midgets that were infinitely adjustable. They were superb machines. They were faster than the homemade midgets. It's too fast. In fact, so fast that you couldn't pass anybody. And secondly, they all looked alike. You see, each midget before that Curtis Craft had a different look to it. Some cars had a flared cowling, some cars had a straight hood. The Curtis Crafts were all the same. And so the race, midget racing became a high-speed dress parade, and the people stopped buying tickets. Really? And the midgets went away and replaced by stock cars. Over how long a span of time from the, oh, from the introduction of the Curtis midget? About three years. Really? Before it killed, it killed midget racing, yeah. It was too bad. Beautiful machine, but nobody wanted to watch it. They wanted to see passing, and they wanted to see some of the cars. It reflected some guy's design thinking, and all the Curtises were the same. With that, a commercial break, and then surprise answers to two must-ask questions. The best driver and most memorable race Chris Economaki has ever seen. Stay tuned for more on this special edition of Wind Tunnel presented by CarQuest. Speed joins the racing community in mourning the loss of Chris Economaki, known as the Dean of American Motorsports Journalism. Economaki died earlier today. He was synonymous with his publication, National Speed Sport News. In tribute, we return you to a Wind Tunnel special from 2006, Economaki, eyewitness to American racing history. <laughs> At a time when the sport desperately needed characters, he painted pictures of the people who drove the cars, who prepared the cars, uh, who promoted the races. And we got to meet some very fascinating people through Chris Economaki's tales. You have seen in action everybody, every driver that any contemporary race fan could name, and many, many more. And of those, am I correct that you identify a midget racer as the best you ever saw? Yeah, well, of course, he later on became a big car racer. That's correct. Bob Swanson from Los Angeles was the finest race driver I ever saw button a crash helmet. No question about that. Why? Well, he understood the car. He understood the track. He understood the rivals. He understood his tires. He understood his engine. He knew what he could do, and he knew what he couldn't do, and he did it well. Better than anybody, better than Foyt, better than Andretti. Uh, let, me give than... You, let me give you an example of Bob Swanson's ability. In 1936, he was an accomplished midget racing driver. The Vanderbilt Cup race was programmed at Roosevelt Raceway on Long Island. It was a zigzag, a pretzel-shaped road course with too many turns. The Europeans all came with their Alfa Romeos and Maseratis and British ERAs and everything. And a California car builder who was famous for his midgets named Danny Hogan built a car for that race, and Swanson drove it. Well, it couldn't match the straightaways. He didn't have the right kind of transmission. But in the turns, he would pass Tazio Nuvolari, who won the race. Nuvolari and versus what, Swanson. Bob Swanson Talk would go a... by Tazio Nuvolari's Alfa Romeo in the corners, and Nuvolari would overtake Swanson, and it would happen over and over again. And when the race was over, Tazio Nuvolari, the famous Italian who won the race, sought out Swanson to tell him 
but he was the finest driver he had ever encountered on a racetrack in his career, which is quite a testament, I think, to Swanson's greatness. The uh, U.S. had a visit to Monza, Italy in 57 and 58, where I was the English-speaking announcer. It was an incredible day of motorsport, both days. Uh, you could see there, watch the Europeans marvel at the American drivers' competitiveness and so forth. That sticks in my mind because there's a certain degree of patriotism involved there. Just because the Europeans up to that point had always looked down on American racing in this country because it was oval tracks and, you know, that's not real racing. Road courses are the answer. But when the Americans showed up in Monza and the Europeans couldn't hold a candle to their abilities, it was, it, it made it a good race. It really did. And some of the things that happened there uh, were, were so memorable. For example, Jim Rathman won the last race uh, there, and uh, Alec Ullman, who was a promoter at Sebring, he was very internationally connected, and he was involved in the officiating crew there for some unknown reason. And he had a fr friend whose name was John Bowes, an obnoxious guy. And uh, he was standing down there on pit lane with a checkered flag, and Rathman wins the race, and he's coasting towards Dan. And of course, what nobody knows is he didn't have any brakes. And so Bowser's is standing out there telling him to stop, stop, and Rathman runs into him, knocks him ass over tea kettle down the track, and he's stretched out. And says, Rathman gets out of the car, rushes over, not commiserating with him about it. He says, you dumb son of a bitch, what are you standing in front of a racing car for that has no brakes? And he's lying on the track. I'll never forget that episode. <laughs> but the, it was the closing episode of Ra American Racing at Monza. It was the winner of the last race, giving hell to some dumb executive who didn't know how to get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> and there are more great stories to come, including my favorite about AJ and Economaki's role as a pioneer in motorsports television. Stay tuned for more of this special edition of Wind Tunnel presented by CarQuest. When he wants to talk to you about something, you can hear him because it's like, ah, hey, uh, Tony, uh, what do you think about uh, this? And then whatever the topic is, and then and then if you keep if you keep him there five minutes and he gets into a story, you're probably going to be there 35 minutes. I remember being at Flemington and it was 72 degrees. The barometric pressure was 63.7, and I was about a dollar fifty short at the pick gate of getting in. And somebody gave me a five dollar bill, and two guys flipped over the guardrail. One burnt cut off his little finger, and he came back, put a tie strap around it, and finished the main event later that evening, finished third. And, then, and that's just stories that he's got all day long. So he's just, he's just cool. What do you think of Tony Stewart? Uh, Tony Stewart, to me, is the ultimate professional driver. He, he grew up in open wheel cars, which are much more difficult to master than a stock car. And he took that talent to stock car racing. He knows tracks, he knows cars. Uh, Stewart is the consummate American racing driver in my book. To me, the, the, the underlying problems NASCAR is facing now is the, the incredible cost of taking part. You know, the advent of technology has raised the cost of today's racing machine to astronomic levels. You need a special racing car for this, for that, the next thing. Many of NASCAR's top teams have 20 cars for each driver. That's expensive. Uh, was it 43 cars in each National Cup race? 43 cars in each Bush race? Each one of those cars needs several million dollars in sponsorship. It's not out there. That's the problem. The cost of taking part in racing today is so high that you have to have sponsorship. And what that tells you is that automobile racing in today's world is a colossal charity case. <laughs> and there's not enough givers out there. That's the problem. When NASCAR began, each team had one car. I can remember the day that somebody brought two cars to a track. It was the talk of the pits. 
Mario Andretti and A.J. Foyt uh, will always uh, stand out. They're both great drivers, and they both wanted to outdo the other guy, and they didn't particularly care for one another. Uh, they shake hands and say hi when they see one another, but they don't go to dinner together. Which one's the better driver? Uh -huh. That's it depends on the day and the track and the car. Yeah. Really. Yeah. So that was the, there wasn't much to choose between the two in terms no, of just ability know, to drive. Foyt is one of the luckiest guys in motorsport. And Mario, unfortunately, is one of the unluckiest guys in motorsport. But Mario uh, won the World Driving Championship, and A.J. Foyt won the 24 Hours of Le Mans. And somebody's going to try to decide which of those two triumphs is paramount, you know. Mario Andretti tried until very recently to win at Le Mans so he could claim superiority over A.J. Foyt. What does it take, what will it take, or can this happen, to return the Indy 500 to its former, yeah, maybe you would argue that it's still there, to its former greatness? I think the uh, prevalence of American drivers. There are too, there are too few American drivers. The Indy Racing League needs to embark on a diversity program to bring in more American drivers. <laughs> Count on Ekotomaki to bring a little perspective to the day's racing issues. We'll have a whole lot more of that kind of thing when Wind Tunnel, presented by CarQuest, continues. Chris's long-awaited autobiography is now available, and I'm betting he'd like it if I told you you can order it through the pages of National Speed Sport News. Forget everything else this guy has done. If you only consider Chris Economaki's television career, he is one of the most influential people in the history of American motorsport. Not quite from the first racing telecast, but very close, Chris was there. And for serious race fans, the thing he brought to the table was credibility. Sure, the other announcers had lots more TV experience, but Economaki knew what he was talking about actually knew the racing game. Let's hear how that all began. I was a racetrack announcer, and I was a track announcer at the Daytona Speedway. And uh, in 1961, when Wide World of Sports was formed by ABC, they wanted to do the July 4th Firecracker 250. And uh, the management of the track was upset with television, it had been there a year before, for a day of racing uh, tailored for TV, and the reviews were miserable. And uh, so the uh, first response to, to ABC was, you go on back to New York, you messed things up here last year. And, uh, ABC said, no, 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 that was another network. We're ABC. So you guys in New York are all the same. Don't bother me. <laughs> but they persisted. And, uh, now, track <laughs> management would have been Mr. France. Yeah, Mr. France. And exactly. the other network would have been CBS. That's correct. Who sent yeah. some lightweight named Walter Cronkite. The, the greatest criticism I've ever heard of an, of an announcer was what Bill France said about the, about the announcers on that CBS show in the middle Sunday of 1960 Speed Weeks. And they asked him what was wrong with the show. And he said, the announcers did not know which way the cars went. Which I thought was an incredible put down. Anyway, I suspect maybe ABC raised the price a little bit. And so they said, well, what can, what can we do to uh, make you agree to let us televise this event? He said, well, you get an announcer that knows which way the cars go. <laughs> and so that was me. And I got pushed on to ABC. And that was my first telecast it was on July 4th, 1961 at the Firecracker 250 race in Daytona. And that began a, a career that lasted for 34 years on television. It was a big day for me. Your early television career produced what I think is one of the funniest interview stories ever. Your interview with A.J. Foyt at Sacramento in <laughs> 1964? Yes, 1964, yeah. Tell me the short version of You don't of really want to hear that. Oh, sure I do. The uh, producer was new, and uh, Rune Eilidge had told him not to come back from Sacramento without an A.J. Foyt interview. This was late in the season. Foyt had won in Indianapolis and almost every other race. Foyt was virtually unbeatable. And anyway, finally, 
get to the track and Foyt's there and the guy says, I want you to interview Foyt right away. I said, no, no, no. I said, he got to go around the track a little bit, get an idea of what the, what the circumstances are like. And, uh, Chris, you know, uh, all right, you say so, but we've got to have this interview. I said, okay. And so Foyt goes out in his car and comes back in and I went over to him and I said, are you busy? He said, no. So I said, I got Foyt and he said, all this. Okay, Chris has got Foyt. Let's get the camera. Get, Stand by. Everything okay. Stops. Yeah, this is the big excitement. moment. <laughs> and I said, AJ, uh, it's a wide, one mile dirt track. And I said, notice you walked around the track before you got in your car. What do you learn by walking around the track? He said, well, Chris, he says, I can't take a shit in the morning. I've had a good long walk. <laughs> so the producer about died when he heard that because that was going to be the Ford interview he brought back. Then I took a beat and continued on with something a little bit more palatable. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the time that you took your, uh, your broadcast colleague, if I'm not mistaken, at the time, Jackie Stewart, to the sprint car race. Well, we were in California uh, for a race at Riverside, and uh, it's on Saturday night. Jackie had, was wondering about these races he heard about at Ascot Park, and so I took him over there. And we walked through the pits, and he's looking at these sprint cars. He kept shaking his head in the negative. He couldn't understand why guys would drive these dangerous things. And we walked past A.J. Watson's pit, and <laughs> A.J. says, Hey, Jackie, I got uh, an open cockpit here. You want to drive? And Jackie says in his Scottish brogue, he says, Ah, I left me helmet in Riverside. And he says, well, we got a helmet. He says, I left me balls there, too. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I always remember that, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's be fair. Jackie, you got a Chris story? The best one was when he was demonstrating the difference between alcohol and gasoline in Indianapolis, and he had a little, a little, uh, ashet of both products and he set light to them. You could see the flame in the gasoline but you couldn't see the flame in the alcohol. They put them out, they thought they had, but the alcohol fire stayed on and Chris walked into it with his double neck polyester pants on and of course he was jumping around like a man wild. All the people watching didn't know. I knew what had happened and he was in fire. I grabbed an old racing suit, wrapped it round his legs. I'm down in front of him on my knees, putting the fire out. Nobody knew. And then he started to undo his belt. And I thought, oh my God, wait till somebody gets this picture. <laughs> I'd pay for a copy of that picture. All right, Economaki, you've told a lot of stories, you've worn a lot of hats, you've played a lot of roles of all the things you've done. What's your favorite? Well, uh, I'm a food and wine guy, so I enjoyed doing the Formula One series all over the world in first-class restaurants. Uh, the deals I always made with television included uh, uh, eating and drinking. And so I was in France and Italy and Japan and Australia. I, uh, it was a gustatorial delight for me. Gustatorial delight, indeed. Words matter to those of us who make our living with them. And Chris has always been fond of the big ones. When we come back with this special edition of Wind Tunnel presented by CarQuest, my favorite example of how Economaki can take racing's big picture and boil it down to a few well-chosen words. Wind Tunnel with Dave Despain is presented by the 3400 CarQuest Auto Parts stores across North America. CarQuest, the professional choice. Brought to you in part by Suzuki. Introducing the new Grand Vitara, the authentic SUV. And by Denso Iridium Power Spark Plugs for improved horsepower and better fuel economy on any vehicle street to strip. He's an icon. That's what I think he is. He, he's in his own way in this sport. Chris Economaki is truly an icon. He's in the league by himself. Uh, always was. He's the one that wrote the style book that to this day we should aspire to. There are few people in motorsports that I respect more than Chris. I, I respect him for his dedication to the game. I respect him for the contribution that he makes. And more than that, for being a friend. If there's ever a guy who lived it all the way to the end, I'm pretty sure that's going to be Chris Economaki.
And with that, time for one last passage from our long conversation with Chris. And I chose this one because it typifies not only his depth of knowledge, but also his profound understanding of the history of racing in America. After all, he was there, not just observing, but taking part. Auto racing from the early 1920s through the mid, early to mid-50s was the salvation of the agricultural fair in this country. The county fair, the state fair, the regional fair, all had an auto race day, which was always the biggest day of the fair. And the money the auto race day made these fairs allowed them to start the following year again. So the auto race was very important to the agricultural fair. That's the connection there. What was the importance of the agricultural fair to auto racing? It was a place to go stretch your stuff and make some money. The agricultural fair was the highlight of the race car owner's season. He could race in March and April and for low money or maybe not get paid at all, but when the fair season began, that's when the money started to roll in. I have heard, little birds have whispered in my ear, that in the heyday of racing at the agricultural fair, a guy named Chris Economaki was the absolute best at convincing the people on the midway that they should come into the grandstand and buy a ticket. Is that true? Well, I don't know how good I was, but that was my job. You know, a promotion, work for a promoter. And, you know, the, the race promoter's uh, uh, financial return was dependent on the deal he struck with the fair. And a big fair, where a smart guy at the top, would never let the promoter on the front gate, if you know what I'm talking about. A manager of a small fair that didn't know too much about business, he did it as a part-time job, he would give the promoter 50% of all the admissions that came out of the grounds that day. Not out of the grandstand, but no, out of the grounds. Uh, the, the sharp guy would say, huh, I'm not letting you on my front gate. You can get 100% of the grandstand. This is after the person has bought their ticket to get out of the grounds. So in order for us to make any money, people had to go to the grandstand. And I did the bally on that. The bally? Oh, that's a carnival term for ballyhoo, the, the chit-chat on the midway that gets people to go to the ticket window. Give me an example. What are you talking about? Okay. Attention on the grounds, ladies and gentlemen. Today, the last day of this great agricultural exposition that is the Midland Park County Fair, it's auto race day. Daredevils from coast to coast are here with their high-speed machines facing death at every turn. The box office is now open. That noise you hear is practice. It's just, up, oh, get that driver out from under that burning car. Please excuse me, folks. It's only practice. Get to the grandstand now. The races begin in a half an hour. That's Bally. <laughs> Bally, courtesy of Chris Economaki, which reminds me that getting the public interested and involved in racing by whatever means is one of the keys to this man's impact on our sport. Think about his definition of the importance of the midget boom. It brought racing to the people. Think about his approach to TV broadcasting. Always true to the diehard fan, but at the same time, welcoming to the newcomer. He is an expert who goes out of his way on behalf of a novice, always searching for that spark that might ignite in someone else the same passion for racing that he has felt for more than seven decades. I think Raleigh Helmling put it pretty well. Every single person involved in racing today owes something to Economaki. So on behalf of us all, I'll say simply, thanks, Chris. But don't for a minute think we've heard the last from this guy, that he's headed out to pasture at the tender age of 85. As always, we'll let Chris have the last word. A very few of us in life get to make their living at something that started as their hobby. And that's been the case with me. And, but as a consequence, you give it more. You throw much more into it because of those circumstances. And that's been the case with me. I just love what I do, and I'm prepared to work overtime at it. Are you seriously considering retirement at I, age 85? I'm trying to retire, and it's very difficult. I don't have the right years for retiring.
We hope you enjoyed Speed's presentation of a wind tunnel special report from 2006. Economaki, eyewitness to American racing history. Chris Economaki died earlier today. The New Jersey native brought motorsports into the mainstream through his TV reporting and his paper, National Speed Sport News. For more on his legacy, go to speed.com.